I'm Mari Goldstein, Senior Public Programs Producer at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a Living Memorial to the Holocaust. And it's a pleasure to welcome you to today's book talk on Dr. David Marwell's book, Mengele, Unmasking the Angel of Death. David served as Director of the Museum of Jewish Heritage for 15 years, and prior to the museum was a former Chief of Investigative Research for the US Department of Justice Office of Special Investigations. It's that part of David's career that he draws on in this excellent new book, which definitively tells the story of Joseph Mengele the man, Mengele the war criminal, and the international hunt for Mengele after the war. David is now president of the Leo Beck Institute and working on other projects, among them a new book. David is in conversation today with Andrew Nagorski, an award-winning journalist and author. Andrew spent more than three decades as a foreign correspondent for Newsweek, a foreign correspondent and editor for Newsweek, working around the world, including in Berlin, Warsaw, Moscow, and Rome. His latest books are The Nazi Hunters and 1941, The Year Germany Lost the War. If you find David and Andy's discussion interesting today, we hope you'll order David's book, which was just released in paperback today and is now out in the US, Germany, Poland, and Bulgaria. You can order your copy at the link in the Zoom chat. Please feel free to share questions in the Zoom Q&A box throughout the discussion, and we'll get to as many as we can towards the end of the hour. Without further ado, welcome to you both. David, congratulations on today's paperback release. Andy, feel free to get us started. Thank you. Thank you, Ari. It's a pleasure to see you and a pleasure to see David again. Uh, I think the first time we met was uh, several years ago when I was just starting on that, uh, working research on the book, The Nazi Hunters, and everybody I talked to in Washington or Tel Aviv or, or, or in Germany said, have you spoken to David Marwell? And uh, it was because, David, you had the perspective of being on the inside for so long, but then being on the outside, able to really look look at the whole picture in a way that I think some people who were directly involved in various aspects of this story and related stories sometimes had a little hard time dealing with and uh, and and you I really appreciated the help you gave me then and I was I was really intrigued when already then you were talking about writing this book uh, the the study of Mengele he is uh, a character who I think we all know in so many ways, uh, and, and there's a lot of mythology, there's a lot of a, a lot of reality, there's a lot of strange twists and turns to the story, and you've done an outstanding job in the book in capturing all that. Uh, now, the, when I first picked up the book, I was struck by the fact that, of course, you start in 1985, which was when uh, Israel, the United States, and Germany to renew, uh, pledged to work together to renew their hunt for, for Mengele and to cooperate. Um, coincidentally, I happened to go to uh, arrive in Bonn as the Newsweek correspondent there in 1985. And that was one of the first stories I was assigned mm -hmm. to. I remember we convened a, a number of European correspondents in my office in Bonn uh, on a conference call with New York in which they said, well, we know these three countries are all looking for Mengele and we want to cover this story and we divvied out assignments, who's going where and who's doing what. And I remember one of my editors saying, well, of course, we've got the Mossad, we've got we, the OSI, the Office of Special Investigations, others really, you know, they've got the, all the resources. We're just a bunch of reporters. But this editor said, wouldn't it be great if we found Mengele? <laughs> and it was, you know, the, let's say the chutzpah factor there was off the charts. Uh, and of course, the irony being that as we all found out soon enough that he had already been dead for since 1979. But that's the story that you tell. Uh, and that's part of the whole, whole narrative here. So before we get into, the, into his personality, into the hunt, can you give David a little more background for everyone here on the call about how you got into this line of work as a historian and investigator, uh, a, a German specialist? Sure, sure. Thanks very much. And first, before I, before I answer that question, I wanna thank the museum and thank Ari for his kind introduction. And thank you, uh, Andy, for agreeing to do this talk. I've always admired your work and, uh, and I appreciate your taking the time today. 
Um, I, I have to say that as a, as a um, academically trained historian, um, I've had a unusual and very blessed career in, in that uh, it was unlike anything I could have imagined um, uh, while I was in graduate school, but I, I, um, I applied for a job at the, the, the newly formed Office of Special Investigations in, uh, I applied actually in, I think in the, uh, the very end of 1979 and was hired in March of 1980 and became the third historian to join the staff at the office. The office had uh, hired a bunch of history graduate students to translate uh, German records and we were essentially at the beginning uh, kind of like uh, um, kind of helping out in the office. Uh, the office was staffed with 10 uh, professional criminal investigators who carried badges and, and guns and they were uh, initially assigned to do the investigation to support the prosecution of Nazi war criminals living in the United States. Uh, but it soon turned out because the crimes that we that the office was involved in happened in, in ocean away and they involved a, a kind of history that was uh, very complicated and uh, really not well remembered by, by people. And uh, we as the historians were able to kind of assume the role of what the investigator in the traditional prosecutor's office um, had. And we eventually surpassed in terms of numbers the the investigators who were assigned to the case so there were there were 10 10 or 11 investigators when when i joined and i was a third historian by the time i left almost a decade later there were 10 historians and and one investigator and we assumed the role of of the investigators uh, we knew the languages we knew the history uh, i remember at one point my my boss the chief historian at the time said you know most of the attorneys can't find ukraine on a map and uh for them to be able to, to explain a complicated history to a judge and be successful in prosecution, they, they needed help in putting the evidence into context. And so we, we had, uh, we were really the first professional historians who were, who were hired on a full-time basis to work uh, in a prosecutor's office. And we, we established what I've coined some time ago, the, the, the field of forensic history in a sense. And uh, so that was very, very interesting. And, our normal cases involved um, usually collaborators um, uh, from Eastern Europe who worked with the, the uh, Nazis who had invaded their countries and helped them uh, carry out their occupation roles. So they were in interpreters, they were uh, auxiliary police officers. And when the war was over, these people came in large numbers to the United States and OSI was established in 1979 to, to investigate them and to try to, to meet out a certain measure of justice by, by uh, denaturalizing them if they were American citizens or deporting them. But uh, in 1983, the attorney general assigned to us a special, uh, invest, a special, special investigation, which was the case of Klaus Barbie, who had been accused of um, having worked uh, with, the, with the Americans at the end of the war. And, it raised the whole issue of Americans uh, using Nazi war criminals as intelligence assets. And I was assigned to that case in 1983 and we wrote a major report that was published the, the summer of 83, which in fact found that Barbie had been used as, a, as an intelligence asset. Uh, in 1985, um, there were similar allegations that were, that were uh, raised about Joseph Mengele and his role vis-a-vis -vis American institutions and American uh, personnel. And we were initially assigned to investigate that. What happened to Mengele at the end of the war? Was he in fact in US custody? Was he uh, a US intelligence asset? Did the United States help him to leave Europe to go to South America? And, and I was assigned to the small team within the office to work on that case. So that took me to the, to the Mengele investigation and the investigation then soon was joined um, by other countries. And our, our mission was broadened to not only account for Mengele's whereabouts at the end of the war and the role or possible role of US institutions or personnel, we were also charged then with trying to find Mengele and to bring him to justice. And in that effort, uh, we were joined by another department in the, in the Justice Department, the uh, US Marshal Service and by the, uh, the first the Germans and then the Israeli uh, 
governments in the form of um, their judicial and police authorities, and in the case of Israel, also their intelligence agency. David, could I want to take a slight step back because I mean yeah. the, the the hunt and then what happens, of course, is fascinating, as uh, which is threads throughout your book. But then there is the whole question of who really was Mengele, even before you get to the end of the war, what happened in terms of his where he was captured, where he, where he, how he eluded everybody. Uh, you know, with Eichmann, there was a famous, of course, the case of, of Hannah Arendt talking about the banality of evil, saying he was a, really more a bureaucrat than a monster. I found it interesting that you get into a similar discussion a little bit with Mengele saying here on the one hand is this person, of course, we know from fact and legend uh, was did monstrous things and, and it's hard to imagine more grotesque some of the uh, events related to his life. And yet at the same time, I found it found it really interesting to see the way you portrayed him as even at Auschwitz. He's thinking about his next academic degree and how he's basically going to uh, plot his career path based on his supposed uh, uh, science at Auschwitz. So was this, again, uh, where do you fall in kind of, if you apply the, the, uh, the debate about Hannah Arendt to Mengele, where, where do you come out on that and how well, do you I see him? One of the challenges in writing about Mengele, and it's a challenge that I didn't completely understand the, the uh, dimension of until I got down to you know, putting pen to paper, at least metaphorically. Um, and that is that um, Mengele became, it, it was a process that began uh, at the, after the war ended um, as, as he left Europe and went went to South America and, and was relatively safe, uh, a, a kind of corresponding process of, of uh, what, I, what I call iconification took place where Mengele assumed the role of, of the icon or the symbol for, uh, for many for the Holocaust itself and certainly for Auschwitz. Um, and that process served in some way to uh, distort in my view and to mythologize uh, Mengele's activities. And so part of my, my uh, goal in the book was to uh, kind of separate uh, Mengele from the myth, myths that had attached themselves to him. And this was something I didn't really realize until I tried to figure out what, what exactly did Mengele do and what, what motivated him and what, what brought him, uh, what, what uh, kind of guided him um, his life and it turns out in my view that um, that it was really his intense engagement and interest in the science that became his 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 passion um, Mengele came from a, a prominent and wealthy family in a small city of Gunzburg in, in Bavaria which Gunzburg, one could say, was a company town, and Mengele's, Mengele's father owned the company. They made farm manufacturing equipment, and Mengele grew up in a this prosperous family as uh, the third son, the oldest of three sons, uh, but showed no no real signs of the man he was to become as a child. He was. Uh, you, you don't see the stories of him, you know, going in the backyard and 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 torturing the, the, the family's pet or anything like that. He had an unremarkable childhood marked by serious illness, but beyond that, um, a warm family, uh, which was described by, its, by people who knew them as conservative and Catholic. Those two, those two adjectives certainly um, stand out. Uh, none of the kind of, uh, uh, radical politics that would uh, engage him later on, none of the um, kind of uh, uh, significant um, anti-Semitism that certainly would be part of his life later on. It really wasn't until he got to the university um, when he became engaged in, in the study of both medicine and anthropology. He earned advanced degrees in both disciplines. And he earned those degrees at a time when those sciences um, 
formed a kind of one historians called it a symbiotic relationship with the Nazi state. They, the, the science of racial, racial hygiene or, or racial science um, actually formed the ideological basis for much of Nazi politics. And that synergistic relationship um, uh, benefited both the state and the science and those who practiced it by elevating the status of the science through funding and through, through promotion and elevating the people who practice it through their own personal status and their sense of, of uh, making a difference. And Mengele had an elite education beginning in uh, 1930 at University of Munich and then studying throughout the great universities in Germany. Um, had no Nobel Prize laureates as his teachers, people who had already earned the Nobel Prize and those who would later earn it uh, later in their careers. And Mengele was, uh, was a very uh, promising prospect uh, and he could look forward to a career in, in science. He not only had his PhD in anthropology, which in, in the Nazi period, it was mainly what we would call today physical anthropology uh, and, and with, a, with a hard focus on, on, on racial science. His mentor was a man named Taylor Mollison, who was a, uh, a real leader in the field. He got his medical license, meaning that he could practice medicine as an MD, but he went beyond that to get a, a PhD in medicine, uh, which allowed him to pursue an academic career to become a university professor or the head of, a, of an institute or a laboratory. Uh, his mentor there was a man named uh, Atmar von Verschur, who was one of the leading geneticists in Germany and the head of the institute in Frankfurt, where Mengele went to become a, an assistant. So he had all of the components of, of a really um, a first rate education and chose a field that was um, benefited greatly by the political uh, and cultural changes that took place in Germany at the time. And he was well set up for a pretty bright future in the field of study that he had chosen and uh, you know, within the society that he thought that the, the Nazi state would, would create. Um, and that's, that's, where, that's, how, that's how he got started. Yeah. And, and I guess, I mean, what I take away from that and from your book is that he saw, I mean, he was basically a careerist and you know, saw his, his life in that field and if some, if the ideology had been somewhat different, if the target of that ideology of some had been different and it had advanced his career, he might have chosen, you know, not so much anti-Semitism as another ideology, uh, hating another group. And I mean, I, it's interesting. I brought this up. I remember with Rafi Aitan, the guy who was the head of the commando unit that took uh, uh, that that kidnapped uh, uh, Eichmann, and he said, you know, if uh, he felt with Eichmann, it was the same thing that, uh, yes, he was an anti, yes, he was anti-Semite, but that was not enough to explain his behavior. If the system he was serving had other goals, he might very well have directed himself elsewhere, but he was primarily trying to please his superiors and to rise up the ladder, as it were, as gruesome as I, that I sounds. Think, I think that's true. I think clearly uh, ambition uh, was a a tremendous motive force for for Mengele, uh, its desire to excel in the field. But I wouldn't discount his his kind of ideological connection. He was by no means uh, an early Nazi. He joined the party, um, uh, in, I think, in 1938. Um, he, he wasn't driven um, uh, primarily by kind of ideological motives, but he did believe in it. It wasn't as if he this was a um, kind of a jacket he put on because it, it was the fashion at the time and he would have taken it off. I think he really was committed. And I, and I think uh, as, I, as I went through his life and, and trying to figure him out, uh, one of the most telling things was his lack of remorse at the end, which was yeah. the lack of remorse of someone who was committed. And, and the testimony of people who served with him was, and I'm talking about his, I'm not talking about his victims, but his colleagues, uh, they they marveled at his at his commitment to the to the ideology, and I think that's that's true, and that's that's I think an important um, 
factor to keep in mind about Mangala. Um, although ambition, um, which of course can be seen by many as a positive thing, um, uh, it's certainly in the case of someone who was um, pursuing science or the science that Mengele did, it, it, it was a, a, a pretty clear path to, to excesses and, and um, um, overcoming what should have been uh, moral and human values. Yeah, well, certainly those did not impede him in any way. Yeah. Um, but I think it again gets safer just not to draw too much on Hannah Arendt, but I mean, her, her argument on Eichmann was, if you consider him a monster, in a way it gets everybody else off the hook. Yeah, these are, yeah. were real people with their own motives that mixed in with the ideology. But let's get- I think I'm, yeah. Go ahead, sorry. I just did one more word on that. I, just, I think that it, it is in fact more comforting in a way to relegate Mengele to the to the world of of monsters of, of yeah. uh, and and more difficult and challenging uh, to consider him to be as, as I say in the book the the both the product and the promise of a much more comprehensive system um, and I think um, I think that's an important to keep in mind um, I think it replaces what is a Kind of grotesque caricature with something that's even more unsettling, which was that he was he was a human being. Right, right. Uh, now, I, I know it's it's a very complex tale, and I don't don't mean to have you go through all of it, but I think it's worth. Can you set the stage here at the end of the war? How Mengele eludes capture, or how he's briefly captured but not recognized? And I think a lot of people today don't don't understand the dynamics of that. And not just in Mengele's case, but in other cases where were fairly well-known figures, what was going on? How could they elude capture? And then what was his path at, on, in the rat line to get to, to Latin America? And, and also what was the role of his, of his family in all this? I'll do my best to be brief here, but it is a complicated story. Yeah. Um, I think the first thing to to remember, and I, re I reminded myself, or I, I, I recognized this fact when we started in 1985. In 1985, Mengele was a far more notorious figure than he was in 1945, except of course, to those who had encountered him personally. But he was, although we knew him as the icon, the symbol of the Holocaust, the symbol of Auschwitz, in 1945, at the end of the war, he was no such thing. The fact that the first thing I did was to try to figure out whether, um, the name itself was anything remarkable. And I discovered that there were 17 other Joseph Mengele's who were active in the German armed forces. Um, some in the SS, one of whom was born in Mengele's own town of Gunzburg. So the, if you consider the, the, um, the uh, challenge of trying to find someone um, named Joseph Mengele when there, it wasn't an unusual name, at least in, in that context. Um, the other, it's true though that Mengele was wanted. He was in the original UN War Crimes uh, uh, Commission list, which was which was incorporated into the Krokas list. So he was on unwanted list. But we found in my investigation back in in uh, when I was with the Justice Department, is that these lists were not efficiently uh, distributed, and we we found that that. In many cases, although the lists may be dated uh, early summer 1945, they weren't. Uh, they didn't find their way to the POW enclosures until much, much later. Sometimes even toward the end of the year. Uh, we know that Mengele left Auschwitz in, in January, mid-January of 1945, before the Soviets uh, liberated the camp. He made his way. It's a. I won't go into all the details, but he found himself at the very end of the war in early May 1945 headed back toward Germany. And he was in uh, what was then Czechoslovakia um, near the town of Karlsbad. And he found, he kind of stumbled upon a military field hospital. And as luck would have it for him, he knew one of the physicians in this field hospital. It was a Wehrmacht field hospital. Mengele asked whether he could join this field hospital. And the commander said, yes. He shed his SS uniform and assumed the identity of a Wehrmacht uh, physician. This particular field hospital found its way northward up through the Hartz Mountains and was in this area, which was called the no man's land. When the war ended, they were in an unoccupied area between the advancing Soviets and the advancing uh, Western allies, in this case, the Americans. 
And Mengele was able to stay with this unit for about six weeks, build a good cover story. And at some point they decided wisely to, to surrender to the Americans and not to the Soviets. Um, and so they went uh, uh, westward, they ended up near, near Hof in Germany and they surrendered to the Americans that were there. And they were taken to a PW, POW camp. They were in that camp, they were in one other camp which, to which they were transferred. And in August of 45, they were released. Um, they were, Mengele, I believe was released under his own name, although there's some question about that. But Mengele didn't have, first of all, the wanted list on which his name appeared hadn't been distributed to the camps where, where he had been interned. And secondly, more important, he didn't have the blood type tattoo under his left arm, which marked every SS or should have marked every SS uh, man. Mengele as the medical officer in the unit that he was assigned to before he went to Auschwitz was responsible for having everyone tattooed with their blood type. And he, through vanity, according to his, his wife, first wife, he didn't have the, uh, the, that telltale marker. And so when, when the US released uh, 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 captured soldier, soldiers from the POW camps, they had them take off the shirts and raise their hands in a kind of, a kind of selection process they went through. And anyone with this telltale mark of the SS on their arm, they would be shunted aside and interrogated more carefully. Mengele was not, he was released uh, and he found his way eventually to a farm in Bavaria where he lived for three years or so as a farm laborer under an assumed name. Uh, his wife would visit him occasionally. Uh, he was able to connect with his son who was then a toddler. But by 1948 with the doctor's trial in, in uh, Nuremberg, um, it became difficult in his view for him to think about building a life again in Germany. So he, with the help of his family's wealth, he was able to make his way um, uh, overland through to Austria, through the Brenner Pass into Italy and eventually to Genoa. He was able to get a Red Cross, uh, Red Cross passport and a landing permit for Argentina and made his way then in uh, the end of May, 1949 uh, sailed to uh, Buenos Aires, where he where he landed sometime in June. Right, that was a well trod path, and uh, yeah, well trod path. Although we didn't find any U.S. or Allied connection in in his right. escape, he used the same kind of uh, infrastructure, and there were a number of people who it was it was a whole, uh, as you say, a whole kind of river. Of, of refugees, not all of them war criminals, some simply people who, who wanted to go back home or wanted to get away from where they were. And, um, and he, he joined in that flow of humanity um, and ended up in, in South America. Yeah. And then, I mean, he gets to the point which a lot of people assume, well, of course, everybody was looking for him. The Mossad must have been looking for him. But we know in reality, the situation was quite different. The Mossad yeah. had other priorities as, as the Israeli state had just been created. Uh, the US had a Cold War had started. So what was the attitude? I mean, how much was he even on the radar screen at first once he got, he got to Argentina? So, so although he arrived under a false name and kept the false name and was nervous, uh, there was really no reason to be at the beginning. Uh, and he did find Buenos Aires a very benign environment. First of all, Juan Perón, uh, provided that in, in, in terms of political environment where he welcomed um, Nazi emigres. And it also was, a, you know, after uh, three years or so as a farm laborer doing, you know, really hard manual labor, uh, Mengele was able again to kind of um, feed the life of the mind. You know, there were theaters and libraries and bookstores in, in Buenos Aires. There was a, a large German emigre community which he connected with, including having met uh, Eichmann a couple of times, although they were really from a different social background and didn't really uh, like each other uh, reportedly or didn't really hit it off. But Mengele uh, did did um, have lots of German friends, uh, including uh, Hans Rudel, who was uh, uh, an important figure for his later uh, success in, in, in hiding. But he really wasn't being looked for. In the 50s, it was like a desert in terms of the prosecution of Nazi war criminals or investigation, both in Germany itself and, uh, and around the world. It really wasn't until um, 1958 um, when uh, 
it's a, also a long, complicated story. But uh, when Mengele's name was was uh, became to emerge as someone of of investigative interest, uh, and um, the German prosecutor uh, near where Mengele's family lived um, began an investigation. There was a criminal complaint, and uh, they sent some police officers to Mengele's uh, town, member of the company town, and start asking questions. Where's Where's young Joseph Mengele? And uh, the family heard of this, and they got word to Mengele in in South America that uh, that there was investigative interest in him, and Mengele then almost immediately decided that he had to leave uh, Argentina because Argentina had a uh, extradition treaty with Germany, although it was a very difficult process and not terribly successful when it was attempted, it still was theoretically possible for him to be, to be um, extradited. So beginning in the, in the fall of 1958, Mengele began to scout out a, another possibility and he had had some connections in Paraguay and decided to go there and by the, the spring of 1959 he was already uh, living in in Paraguay and um, was uh, got got citizenship there through fraud was able to be naturalized as a Paraguayan citizen and the reason that was important is under Paraguayan law you couldn't be extradited if you were a citizen of Paraguay so Mengele felt pretty good, so good that he kept his name Jose Mengele and lived in Paraguay. His family visited him. His his wife, whom he had married in his second wife, whom he had married in 1958, uh, 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 who was still living in, in in Buenos Aires after he left, would visit him. His father, I think, or his brother visited him, and some people from the family firm visited him. Uh, he felt very very comfortable until a particular event happened in May of 1960, which was the Israeli capture of Eichmann, which showed, I can imagine the the uh, aha moment that Mengele had when he learned about uh, Eichmann's capture was that it doesn't matter if there's an extradition treaty uh, or not with Paraguay. If the Israelis are willing to snatch someone uh, off the streets in Buenos Aires, they can do the same to me here. So at that point, he decided to go to go underground, really underground. New name, new country, which from which he had never visited, at least not in any significant way. And he went he went in the, the fall of 1960 to uh, to uh, Brazil, where he yeah. spent his last seven, 19 years of his life. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one of the great ironies, of course, is that he did get away, but and and that he but he thought the Israelis or Wiesenthal or some combination of, 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 of folks are, were after him all the way, which yeah. as we now know, and as you write, the Israelis did have some discussions when they went after Eichmann. They thought Mengele might still be in, in Buenos Aires, but they, didn't, but they weren't sure. And then they were afraid of diluting their efforts. But until the last, didn't he, you write, and I'll just probably just make this the last question that I'd like to open up to the audience, that he he wrote basically a, what he called uh, an auto fiction about his life, a, an account of his yeah. life. Um, and, and he wrote letters to, I think, to his family, in which it indicates that he was, he was obsessed for the rest of for that last period of his life about being about being captured. So at least he did not, let us say, die in peace, even though he eluded everybody and then managed to even uh, his family even managed to keep it uh, quiet that he had died. Yeah. So he, he uh, you know, in well, I was almost finished with the first draft of the book when in September 2017, the Israelis released and declassified a major report, several hundred pages, uh, based on their Mengele file. And I learned through that something I didn't know before, a, few, a number of things. But one was how um, how uh, uh, focused they were for a period of time in finding Mengele, beginning after the Eichmann kidnapping, where they, they had tried to, you know, they'd send a team after Eichmann was safely in the safe house. They went out to his last known address and they couldn't find him. But they recruited um, a very effective agent a man named Villain Sassen in, in uh, Buenos Aires, who eventually led them to Brazil. And they were within um, 
pretty likely, I mean, we can't be 100% sure, but we, I believe in the, in the summer of 1962, they were you know, 20 or 30 meters away from, from Mengele when he was on this farm near Sao Paulo. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were quite close to cracking, cracking the whole, the whole uh, structure that was established to protect Mengele in South America and Brazil specifically. Um, they didn't get there, but but by all reports, Mengele was looking over his shoulder all the time because he was certain that they were going to get him. So his last years were not the kind of um, you know comfortable life you know on the plantation near the river with dogs and and cigarette boats in the river uh, that one imagined or that we imagined he was living when when we were looking for him in '85. He lived a, a, a pretty furtive and, um, and uh, sparse life um, um, in, in a suburb of, of Sao Paulo where, where he ended up dying in, in 1979. Yeah, yeah. He, he certainly did. Um, uh, my apologies one second. I just I managed to hit something wrong again and I just wanted, and I lost, I wanted to start getting back, get to the questions. Ari, if you hear me, can you uh, just email me the questions because uh, I think I may have just closed something by mistake. My apologies. Hold on a second. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna. I think we do the the Q and A button on the bottom there. There's a. Yeah, I just seem to have. Let me get back in. It blocked me for some reason. Maybe. I, yeah. I may. Have, okay. Okay. I'm back there. Okay. All right. So I've got. Got it. Okay. Um, all right, why don't I just go through some of these questions sure. and, and uh, let's, let's see. Uh, so there's, there's a question, we get back to the Underground Railroad to Latin America, uh, Nazi sympathizers. Um, and the question is how much blame should be cast on South American dictators for, for that railroad? Uh, who, who really was responsible for it? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I won't claim to be an expert on, on this, but I can sell, tell you that uh, certainly Juan Perón in, in Argentina, he, he was in, in power until 1955, I believe. Uh, when he left, uh, the, the atmosphere changed uh, drastically and it was no longer such a b benign haven for Nazis. Uh, Paraguay um, emerged as, as an attractive place to go because of the president of, of Paraguay, Alfredo Stroessner, who, who, uh, whose father, I believe, was uh, from Bavaria, and he offered uh, uh, another haven for them. So, what what's the role of the responsibility? Certainly, um, they bear a huge responsibility for the welcoming, um, kind of the welcome environment that that they provided, and um, and probably also for their having not. Um, you know, um, effectively uh, searched or or aided the search of other countries who were looking within their borders. And there's a question about what happened to his family members. I mean, you had Rolf, his son, who was you know, for all, and and the obvious question I think for a lot of people, I remember that intrigued us when we were covering this story, is why had the family maintained the fiction that he was alive for so long? It just or I don't think I'm giving anything away here. He died in 1979, as you say, probably had a heart attack, I gather, while he was swimming. Or a stroke, probably. Was or a stroke. Um, and yet, here we were in 85, and uh, the hunt, hunt was still allegedly on, and, and right. uh, no one would, would confirm that, that he, he had died. Right. So what well, was involved but, here? Yeah, so the, 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 we, have, we have a little bit of a... Of a of a hint as to why the family didn't cooperate. There's a letter that the letter from the family in Brazil that was shielding Mengele and providing him with, with comfort and uh, companionship. When they reported his death to, uh, to his son, to Mengele's son, they said, we're gonna keep this quiet. And there's a, there's a implication in the letter that, that uh, that'll just keep them looking as if it were a, a kind of mischievous, uh, you know, they should waste their time looking for him, uh, even though he's dead. So there was, 
and the family didn't want to bring attention to themselves. It really until uh, you know there was there was a kind of background noise about where Mengele was, but it wasn't until 1985 when when this really erupted actually in 84 when, when there was a movement to, uh, uh, in Paraguay to, because everyone believed he was in Paraguay to try to get him to uh, try to get uh, Stroessner to, to uh, cough up Mengele. And uh, so the, the family um, family just didn't want to, didn't want to help. They didn't want to uh, participate. And I think they felt that they would remain less in the public eye if they, if they simply didn't do anything. That change, of course, the calculus changed once the investigation began. And in terms of their own legal liability, uh, under German criminal law, there's a criminal procedure. There's no way that a family can be obliged to testify against a family member. Um, there's no, un, no obligation for them to have offered up the information that Mengele was uh, living in South America. There was no question that they could be charged with obstruction of justice. Other members, you know, and people in the firm who were supporting it and other people who assisted in kind of Mengele's communication system that they established, they, they would have been guilty of, uh, of, could have been guilty of, of obstruction of justice, but not the family. Another question from an audience member. What happened to the other leading Nazi eugenicists and you know, racial, quote unquote, racial scientists? Uh, can you, I mean, of course, there are many, many cases, but uh, any, any, anything nearly as prominent as Mengele? And do you know much well, about I, the fate of others? Again, there's uh, Mengele became much more famous after, after he, he did what he did. Uh, he wasn't so famous at the time. I, I guess the, the, the issue of Mengele's mentor, who was really one of the leading uh, race, race scientists and uh, um, um, geneticists uh, in Germany at the time, was the founder of the, of the at the time, leading journal in, in, in terms of um, race science, a guy named Van Fershur. Um, he survived the war. Um, and he ended up having quite a career at the University of Munster as a, as a German geneticist. Um, when Mengele was at, at Auschwitz, it's, it's absolutely clear that he had an ongoing relationship with uh, Fershur, who was the head of the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute in Berlin, that he would, be, he would send uh, samples of kind of growth and anomalies uh, or unusual specimens from, from the camp to the Institute um, he was the experiments he did with with uh, eye color. He was doing on behalf of and in consultation with a woman named Karen Magnuson, who was a, a ophthalmologist who studied eye color and the and the phenomenon of heterochromia, which is when one person has two different color eyes. He was sending the the harvested eyes of people with this condition to her in Berlin for her further study. He sent uh, two hundred blood samples from uh, the whole variety of people from different ethnic and racial backgrounds from Berlin to Fershore in Berlin so that Fershore could uh, proceed with a, a study of what, what was then known as specific proteins, which was an attempt to find a, a, a racial um, um, diagnosis, the ability to diagnose race by looking at, at blood and certain proteins. Um, so. And for sure ended up without being prosecuted and uh, had a, a substantial career in post-war Germany. He, he clearly destroyed all the correspondence that he had had with, uh, with Mengele, although some of his correspondence with the, with the um, German foundation that supported research, research scientific research, he included, uh, he talked about Mengele in, those, in some of those reports. But that's, I think, the most prominent of the racial scientists. Yeah, and a question, related question, from 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 another audience member: Did any important scientific insights come from from the, these ex, his ex, Mengele's experiments on twins, eye color? Can anything be said said about that? And, and it's interesting that occasionally there's still stories that come out saying, you know, drawing on such experiments and, and, and discussion was, was there anything that could be, could say was, was uh, so, so pure the, sadism? Right, so the, the, the answer to that question is, I don't know, uh, because 
the answer is no, but the, the reason why the answer is no is that um, we don't really know the nature of Mengele's experiments at Auschwitz with, with a few exceptions. We know a little bit about the eye color experiments, which were not by the way to change the color of eyes to make them more Aryan in, in appearance. It really had to do with a much more serious undertaking, which was to, to try to understand um, what, what the uh, structures and, and perhaps genetics involved in eye color are, the, the production of pigment and the, the structure of the eye. Um, so we, we know the nature of those experiments where Mengele was, was putting um, certain hormones, probably adrenaline in the eyes of some subjects and then recording things. Um, we, the specific protein experiments, we know a little bit because of progress reports that were filed with the foundation that was supporting the research. There's only one situation where I think one could make the argument that the, the, the research that was done there um, had some impact, at least it was in the hands of people and could be used. And that is, there was a disease called NOMA, which is an, an oral cancer, which had essentially disappeared from the developed world by the time, by the middle part of the 20th century, there was a huge outbreak in, in, uh, in Auschwitz when Mengele arrived. And Mengele decided he wanted to find a, a, an effective treatment for this, this, this disease, which was quite alarming because it, it ate away at the, the soft tissue around the mouth and created some, uh, eventually led to death, but also people's uh, kind of cheeks would, would, would uh, fall away. Uh, so Mengele decided in trying to find a treatment for this disease, he recruited, I use uh, air quotes, a, a very prominent Czech physician named Bertold Epstein, who was in another part of the Auschwitz complex and brought Epstein to the gypsy camp where Mengele was the, the uh, camp physician. And they set up a, uh, a kind of ward in one of the barracks and they, they even increased uh, some of the nutritional uh, nutrition that the, the young kids were, were getting. And Epstein experimented with different types of drugs and different drug combinations. And uh, we know this because there was another inmate physician named Lucy Adelsberger from Berlin, who in 1946 wrote an article for Lancet, the medical, British medical journal, about Epstein's work under Mengele at Auschwitz to, to cure the case of, of the disease of Noma. Um, a couple of ironies here. One is that the cause of the disease was the camp itself. It was poor nutrition and poor sanitary conditions. Um, the other irony, which is, which is terribly tragic, is that no child who was cured by Dr. Epstein of the disease of Noma survived the camp because uh, they, were, they were then liquidated or murdered at the, when the camp, the gypsy, so-called gypsy camp was, was, uh, was liquidated or murdered. So that you end up uh, with this one example where at least the, the work that was done there um, was, um, although this wasn't Mengele's own science, but it was science that he brought under his the kind of structure of his research at Auschwitz um, and ended up in a very prestigious um, journal in um, 1946. We're, we're getting close to time, so, but I, and a number of people have asked uh, questions related to Nazi war criminals in the US. So this is not direct Mengele, obviously you've dealt with the issue of whether the US was involved and, and, and in his case, it actually looks like it wasn't, um, but there were of course, Nazi war criminals and, and, and uh, people are, and there is a question whether to what extent at the Department of Justice were you involved in investigating these cases and, and the whole issue of some of them collecting US social security and so forth. I, I, it's, I know it's a, it's a complicated legal, moral, political issue, but briefly, can you just explain the situation the Office of Special Investigations was in, in, in investigating such cases? Sure, so, so in, in most cases, of course, there, there wasn't any uh, allegation that the, the people who were the subjects of our investigations had been uh, uh, assisting the U.S. government in any way. They were, they were people who had assisted the, 
the Nazis and found their way, found themselves in this kind of sea of displaced humanity at the end of the war. And they lied about their past to get to the United States by having glossed over their, their work for the Nazis. There were, there were people who, who, uh, who worked for uh, the allies. Uh, Klaus Barbie is probably the poster boy uh, for them. Um, we found in our investigation of Klaus Barbie that the people who recruited him at the time, again, context is so important. What did people know at the time when they recruited him? It's unlikely that they knew of his war crimes. Uh, at some point they did know that he was accused of war crimes because the French had requested his extradition for to stand trial in the French zone. And the Americans decided because they suspected the French of being uh, infiltrated by, by the Soviets, the French intelligence services, they decided um, that they would get, get um, um, Barbie out of Europe to South America. And they used then the so-called rat line, a, a similar path to which uh, Mengele took, but with, with the help of US intelligence. Uh, so that's the most famous one, but there are other examples of, there are examples of, uh, at OSI, we had subjects who were involved in the so-called Project Paperclip who were, who were um, uh, had been, uh, uh, involved in the persecution of individuals during the war and then um, kind of linked their stars to the Americans by, by uh, helping us in our space program and in things like uh, aeromedical research and, and uh, other, other factors. And there, were a, there are a few um, kind of other examples that, that have been written about of people who, who had been at the end of the war during the Cold War had been recruited. Uh, it's impossible to understand that whole concept of Americans using Nazis without understanding the the, uh, the timing and the context of the Cold War and how uh, one enemy, one perceived enemy replaced another enemy. And uh, the, the US intelligence who was responsible and was passionate and effective in the early days in the post-war period in going after Nazi war criminals, when their mission shifted to um, going after and protecting against the Soviets, then the Germans became, Nazis became uh, perfect uh, uh, allies in that because they had such experience in combating the Soviets. You know, the German army fought the Red Army on the ground for four years. Uh, they knew a lot about German military tactics. Um, every map in the backpack of a, of an art, of a company commander uh, in, in the early post-war period was made from Luftwaffe photographs that, aerial photographs that had been captured and, and uh, translated through cartography into uh, detailed maps. So um, in a way, uh, one can understand, uh, but not really, uh, this is no way my condoning this, but one can understand the uh, the reason why some Nazis were attractive targets of recruitment by by American intelligence. Well, of course, um, by also by Soviet intelligence, and of yes, course the, and, and of yeah. course the the whole uh, race to who grabbed which rocket scientists was uh, so. Yeah, in a way, it was the, 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 those programs were in, in as much denial programs as they were exploitation programs to keep keep these valuable people out of the hands of the other side. Oh yes, yeah, yeah. Okay. The kidnapping and mutual kidnapping, and yeah. and, I, and I think then the, the other note again is uh, maybe you could also address this a little more. How much did you have contact with the Israelis involved in this? And uh, again, they, they the myth that they were going after Nazis from the very beginning was was clearly overblown. Although then they got serious with Eichmann, and then as you say. They, they were probably at least more serious for a bit longer than was generally perceived about Mengele. Uh, yeah, so they, they I, 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 I write in the book about how um, they, they were quite effective and very creative in their attempts to get Mengele until, until um, the late mid 60s, 67 or so, when they actually stopped. They, they, they stopped looking for Nazi war criminals because they believed probably correctly that that current threats to the security of Israel were loomed much larger than than the the threat of of kind of old enemies and it wasn't until um, Menachem Begin became prime minister in 1977 I think uh, 
when he called in the head of, of Mossad and said, let's, let's go after, I wanna re recommence the search for Nazi war criminals. And the head of the Mossad at that point was, was really argued against it, but they agreed, compromised on that they would pick a small number that they would focus on, one of whom was Mengele. So we worked closely with the Israelis, both the, uh, the Israelis established a, a interagency working group with uh, the police, uh, the justice people, and I found out later, although because they never had introduced themselves that way, but and the Mossad, and the Mossad actually led led the effort. I am told, um, and that's why the the uh, release of this report in nineteen in twenty seventeen was so revealing because I realized what the people I was sitting across from the table knew about. Mengele and knew about their past efforts to find him and some of it would have been helpful to know it when we were involved in the investigation. And it's interesting that even in some of the memoirs of some of the Mossad agents involved in the Eichmann case who were involved then in, in that hunt for Mengele, some of them recall a specific moment when they're basically told, drop this, we've got other yeah. priorities. And, and, yeah. and in one case, it was, it was involved finding, I think, a child uh, from a, a family in Brooklyn who there was right. a complicated Good family market. custody case and, and, and yeah. the, this agent was just fuming. How, how am I being called off the hunt for Mengele for, for basically a family custody case? Uh, right. but, but that's a whole, whole nother saga. Um, yeah. um, did you, I think we're almost out of time. Ari, are we, okay. did you want to add anything here? But I wanted to thank you, David. That's, uh, you know, it's been uh, terrific to hear your, your take on this. And please do read the book. There is a lot more there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Since we do have two minutes, I guess I might turn it back to both of you and ask just in a couple sentences, what do you think we should take from Mangala's story? What do you want to leave with the audience today? Uh, I'll defer to David here first. Well, I, I think these days, and it's, it's been, uh, I think, underscored by, by the, in some ways, by the COVID um, pandemic and, and all of the issues of, of medical ethics that have, that have been raised through it, um, that, uh, you know, with, with modern medical technology, you don't have to be a Nobel Prize winner or a millionaire to, to uh, be involved in research that Mengele could only have dreamt about the ability to to um, um, to shape and guide you know the the particular uh, genetic makeup of an individual and the rest of their line. Um, you know, Mengele um, gave in to whatever motives they were uh, ambition. Um, sadism, what, whatever, whatever drove him. But I would argue that it was mainly ambition, um, crossed over whatever boundaries had been established and had been accepted by the profession that he had joined. Um, and um, I think it's an, that's an important lesson for us, especially now when the, the, the power that, that science has uh, is uh, exponentially greater than it was even in his time. I just very briefly add, I think, you know, as I alluded to the fact that the fact that Mengele, as David explains, for the, at the end of his life for many years was really worried about being hunted down. You can say the Mengele was the great, great one who got away, uh, great, and obviously not in a positive sense, but a, 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 but a failure. But the fact that he was always felt hunted and this whole business of Nazi hunting was such, it was hit or missed and there were many failures, but there were also, the successes were enough that it put the pressure on. And I think it showed that uh, eventually you pay a price in some way, even if you are not physically captured the way Eichmann was. Thank you for leaving us with that, Andy and David. Learn more about Mangala, his life, his death, his capture in Mangala, Unmasking the Angel of Death. The link is in the Zoom chat. Um, it's terrific to learn from you both today. The story is so endlessly terrible and intriguing and, and interesting. So um, we're, we're grateful for your time and your insights. Uh, to all of you joining us today, thank you for tuning in.
Everything we do at the museum is made possible through donor support. So thank you to those of you who are donors and members on, on the Zoom call today. If you're not and you're able, we hope you'll consider supporting the museum's work at the link in the Zoom chat and joining us for our upcoming programs and events. We wish everyone a great afternoon. Take care, Andy and David. Thank you.